Hi everyone. Hi again. We're in Genesis chapter 7 now, the flood account. Mm -hmm. And we're going to read Genesis 7, 1 to 16 from the NIV and then from the ESV. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive through the earth. Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. And rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I think you will notice first the three times it's been emphasized now in this passage that God had commanded him. He, they went in and did just as God had commanded or Yahweh had commanded back in verse 5. Mm -hmm. So two names going back and forth. The two names are here in verse 16 as well. Elohim had commanded him and Yahweh shut him in. Mm. So I think that's something I would have missed as a witness. But, mm -hmm. but, but back, back in verse 2 take with you seven pairs of all clean animals. So the usual explanation of that in the commentaries is that some were used for sacrifice. Right? So so even during the year, a little bit more than a year that they're in the ark, they're offering animal sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that Noah does after the flood when they get back on, on ground is offer a build an altar and offer sacrifice again. Which was just the clean animals, right? So contrary to the the liberal point of view about this, that this is all just myth. Well, I knew even back then, because I was collecting books on mythology and ancient history, and mm -hmm. I knew back then that these are two, these are two universal myths. First of all, a universal flood, or at least a great flood that destroys humanity, and only a few are left. That's mm -hmm. universal. Yeah. And also this idea of blood sacrifice. I think for me, whenever I heard the word myth, I thought, make believe story, fantasy, fairy tale, mm -hmm. right? Those were the words <laughs> that I connected with that. And I do remember Victor Shepherd when he was preaching, he talked a lot about myth and he defined it for us. That So myth, it, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but myth as really a story that tells a truth. So it was the first time I'd ever heard that a story or a narrative that tells a universally yeah. accepted truth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's something that projects something that that's true to explain it to you to it, to um, help you relate to it. I guess so. The story doesn't have to be untrue. The literal story. It could be true, or it could be just a story, like yeah. a parable or to, an allegory to right? illustrate something. But yeah. th there's a truth embedded in it. But against the, the grain here of those who want to make all of this about myth. Mm -hmm. 
like I said, there's universal myths, and one of them is the flood, a great flood that is a catastrophe that kind of breaks history in two, mm -hmm. and blood sacrifice. So around the world you look and you see the story of a flood and also the idea that somehow we can only atone for our sins and cover our sins by the sacrifice of a living thing. Yeah. And, and it, when, we, when we put the links in, one of them will be to an abuse of that, which is yeah. the, the, the Canaanites and the other neighbors of Israel were mm -hmm. depraved, even in their understanding. They've kept the understanding mm -hmm. of blood sacrifice, but they've even taken the principle to now sacrificing their own children. Mm -hmm. That's the culture that Abraham, of course, offered Isaac up in, that it was normal in that culture to offer your children for your sin, but of course God didn't require that of Abraham, even though the test is of, of that nature. Mm. But I also wanted to just go back to verse 16. Mm -hmm. God commanded him, the, the, the children who we don't know are righteous, it doesn't say a word about their morality or mm -hmm. their faith, but it, we, don't, we know that I guess they have cooperated in helping Noah build this ark. Mm -hmm. So the family does the work three times emphasized that they did just as God had commanded but yeah. but Yahweh shut him in so the two names are there yeah. the name that's associated specifically with the care and the salvation mm -hmm. is Yahweh so we're back to the covenant meaning and then in in the first verse and the last verse it has God doing something but it doesn't tell you how how he does that and I would never, as a witness, have asked that question. How did he say to him? You know, I just, I guess I just envisioned a booming voice or, or, you know, planting it in your brain or something and saying it's from me, God, I'm speaking to you. But it doesn't actually say it in the passage. So for the first time going through the whole book of Genesis, I was careful to look at how does it tell you? Does it tell you exactly how? Or am I projecting my own yeah. ideas or the ideas of the watchtower more likely into the text? And Yahweh shut him in? Yeah. What do you do with that? Yeah. So I think it just even just having that possibility in your head that it might not be the way you think well, is a good thing to yeah. do as you read through the book. The idea or the picture now in your head, Yahweh shut him in. So it wasn't just that the door miraculously closed. Yeah, which is it's certainly not what I thought back then. But this yeah. is consistent with what we've seen already, that Yahweh is personally present in chapter 3, and apparently in front of Cain in chapter 4, and, and Enoch walks with God, and Noah now is said to walk with God earlier mm -hmm. in the chapter. Mm -hmm. well, it's just totally consistent that Yahweh is somehow there, personally present. Mm -hmm. So we'll put a link into uh, the Canaanite version of the of the blood sacrifice idea. Mm -hmm. The the irrational and depraved nature of the religions of both the Canaanites and the other neighbors around Israel. And the and the playlist for, for Genesis we'll we'll put that into. Mm -hmm.